As way of introduction, the Anti-Poverty Network is an alliance of people on low incomes, and in particular, people on welfare payments, on Centrelink um, benefits. And so we're made up of unemployed people, sole parents, carers, aids and disability pensioners, students, and other people living below the poverty line, and often living very, very below the poverty line. Um, and our job is to is um, to provide a voice um, for people on low incomes and to um, really um, challenge, I think, a number of the, um, the policies and a number of the attitudes around poverty and unemployment and um, welfare in this country. So how today is going to work is, first, you'll be hearing from a number of people um, from our group um, who've been unemployed or have experience of struggling to look for work and living on a very low income. Um, they'll come up at the front and speak. And then after that, we'll have um, a Q&A with the six candidates who I'll introduce in a sec. And um, so then at the end of the event, the candidates will all get um, like a few minutes to um, kind of wrap up and, and um, and reflect on what they've heard today. So what we wanted to do um, today was something a little different where um, as much as possible we would have the candidates um, listening to people who've directly gone through the experience of being out of work and being poor. And um, In our view this is something that um, happens nowhere near often enough in this country and we're very glad that we have um, um, representatives from so many parties here. So um, I'll just introduce them all. Uh, um, next to me is Sean Edwards, who's a Liberal Party Senator of South Australia. Next to him, Robert Sims, uh, um, Australian Greens Senator of South Australia. Next to him, Nick, Nick Champion, who's the um, Labor MP for Wakefield. Artie Pretty from the Australian uh, Progressives, their um, Senate candidate. Bob Days, the um, Family First Senator for South Australia. And at the far end, Sky Koshki Moore, who's a Nick Xenophon team Senate candidate for South Australia. So we'll be hearing from them. And they will be. My little um, thing that I want to talk about today is about the issue based on my own experience about people who find themselves on Newstart and who are not only unable to get work, but one of the reasons that they're not able to get work is because they may have some illness, sickness or disability. And I just want to, to spend a minute or two talking about my experience that I had with what we call a disability employment service. Now, does everybody know what that is? Everybody, everybody's here heard of it. It's the, Basically, if you're on New Start, you are required to either go with what they now call the Job Active or the Disability Employment Service. And supposedly, they're going to help you, assist you in gaining employment. And I had been, unfortunately, unemployed for a while. And I had found that, although I knew I had some difficulties, uh, some, maybe some minor learning difficulties, I did not think, certainly, that they were major things. But unknown to me, there were a few other issues in my life and my condition. And meantime, the, the job network, or the DES that I was with, um, was requiring me to do look for full-time work, which is, which is what I wanted. I wanted to get a job. I wanted to get off the dole. I never, you know, want to stay on Centrelink payment at all. I'm sure most people here would agree with that. They don't want to have to be on a, on a Centrelink payment. And I found that what they were sending me to, the type of jobs, and my type of experience was woefully inadequate 
in terms of A, getting me to an interview, but also in terms of actually getting me into a job where I could use what skills and abilities that I actually do have. They made assumptions about me and they tried to push me in certain directions. Now, when I did become more aware of certain conditions that I had that made it more difficult for me to get jobs, purely by chance, by the way, and that's another thing that I wish to point out. People think that with the Disability Employment Service, well, it's got the word disability there, so therefore, they must have specialised disability workers. They must have people there that would be able to detect, understand, you know, people who have mental health conditions or uh, disorders or disabilities or what have you. Uh, that's not the case, certainly not in the ones that I experienced. Um, there's very little difference um, with the job actives or what was then called um, <coughs> the job networks at the time. And in fact, my uh, case manager said to me, the only difference between the disability employment services and the job networks is the fact that if you gain employment, if, not when, but if, then they will actually come out and, you know, advocate on your behalf or maybe for, you know, workplace modifications or, or something to that effect. But in terms of actually getting you employment or taking into account that maybe your disabilities or your difficulties put you at a disadvantage, because as you know, we have to compete. In the labour market, it's very, very tough because there are literally not enough jobs to go around. You'll probably hear more about that today. That's certainly around here in the north. There is literally not enough jobs to go around. That's a fact. Um, so we have to compete for all these jobs with no guarantees whatsoever, and there are not enough jobs to go around. And so I just felt like I was just going on the treadmill, just going, 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 and not really going anywhere. I had done the job clubs, I had turned up to all my appointments. Man, if they said do something, I did it. And I did it with enthusiasm. So I want to just say today that the Disability Employment Services and the Job Actors really need to be reformed. They really need to be changed to take into account people's situations. And they need to take a much more holistic approach and say, hey, what are the real, actual obstacles? And listen to the people that are in their care. Listen to them and actually hear what they have to say. Because I feel that's not, not happening. Their voice of people in the New Start, which is, by the way, is woefully inadequate at, what, 260 or so a week? Yes. How on earth are we supposed to live on that? I do not think that most people who are in employment today would be able to live on $260 a week, and yet people on New Start are expected to do so. That's New Start, that's that payment, by the way, that hasn't been raised in what, real terms in 22 years? Yeah. And being at such a level, it actually puts you at a disadvantage. Far from helping you to actually get employment, it actually has the opposite effect. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And so, and I found that again, you're just on the treadmill, going, 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 but not really getting anywhere, and certainly not being held. Yes. Now, there were other little things that I noticed. For example, I would used to I used to ask the people in my disability employment service questions. I used to talk to them. I would say, "What did you used to do before you actually got into this job?" Mm -hmm. And um, they would say, "Oh, well, I did retail, or I did, you know, yeah. marketing, or I did business, or, or something like that." Now, I had, I have, for those who don't know, I've done a number of years of study in the area of community services and community work. And I realised from my own studies that they didn't have the same type of qualifications. They were dealing with people. And they were dealing with people, certainly people who had come from all sorts of situations. Um, and they were dealing with people who, they really didn't have the knowledge or the skills that I was learning in my community work courses and I thought, this isn't working. They're taking a business model, and yes, we do need to have some of that, to be sure, because we've got to operate in the real world, I understand that, but they were not actually listening to their clients. Also, I found that many times, the people who were working in the disability employment services had a very, very big caseload. I mean, quite huge, you know. And um, they, you know, if you sit down and you work it out, the quality time that they would have to spend with their clients, well, they wouldn't have it, because they've just got so many, you know, because that's such a huge caseload. So to me, the whole system just needs to be totally reformed, totally changed. Yeah. It needs to be a listening 
and caring system. Yes, it's got to tr train people for jobs, and yes, it's got to give them the skills to do interviews and all of those type of things. All of that's important as well. But they need to go a bit beyond that. And th that's, that's why I just wanted to mention that today. Now, I don't want to go on too much longer, but I do want to mention very briefly about people who are on New Start, as I mentioned before, who do have actual, in some cases, diagnosed conditions. Yes. How, now let me ask you a question. Yes. Centrelink has said of these people that they can only do 15 hours a week for as far as the expectations in terms of their work capabilities. Now I have a simple question to ask you. Even if they were successful in getting the person a, a job at 15 hours a week, is that going to be enough to get them off of Centrelink? No, is that no, going to be no, enough no. to get them you know, independent? No. Is it? So that they'll never have to go back on New Start again? Right. That they'll never have to darken the doors of a Centrelink office? Mm -hmm. Of course not. So why are they trying to get them a job at 15 to 20 hours a week when they know full well that they're still going to be stuck on New Start? Mm -hmm. Why? I just find this whole system very, very discouraging. And um, just being on New Start itself does have a negative effect on people's mental health. Yes. Yes. I mean, yes. they talk about how people behave. Well, I mean, it's a fact that often when people do lose well, you know, jobs and they find themselves on New Start, first they, they're in shock because they just simply can't believe that New Start is only like 250 or 260 or 270 or whatever yeah. it is yeah. per week. Yeah. Yeah. They can't believe that. And they ask, how can the government that is in power treat their own citizens like that? Yeah. Mm. Yep. Because a country like Australia is going to be judged, is going to be assessed by other nations in the way that it treats its own citizens, mm. in the way that it treats its own people. You know. Mm. Yeah. So does the government, that's what I want to ask, do they have respect? And do they have respect towards the people the citizens of their country who are genuinely, especially those who are genuinely wanting to get off Centrelink, who are wanting to get into the employment market, in a situation, of course, where sadly we simply don't have enough jobs to go around, but nevertheless, we continue on the treadmill, continue on the treadmill, continue on the treadmill, <laughs> all the while being on $260 a week. In the latest, as I said, there are some people who simply will not be able to get work and they're stuck on New Start. Some of these people should be on disability pension. Mm -hmm. yep. mm -hmm. yeah. But increasingly, and I've heard so many stories, so many stories I've heard, yes. of people who cannot get onto the DSP. Yes. Do yeah. they have genuine, do they have diagnosed um, disabilities, disorders, or mental health issues that actually do impact on their capacity to actually work? Yes, yes they do. I could give many, many examples, so I simply don't have the time. I'll just give one, which I heard, because I couldn't believe this one. I know of a woman, a friend of mine, who was told by Centrelink that her work capacities are at eight hours a week. Eight. <coughs> that means that Centrelink says, well, you can work eight hours a week. That's what we believe. And yet, she's still on New Start. She's had a nervous breakdown. She's had mental health issues. She's got physical disabilities. Yeah. And yet, she's supposed to, you know, be out yeah. looking for work. Yeah. yeah. I can't believe that. How can the government treat people like that? Why are they doing that? Because they've never had to do it themselves. Maybe they've That's never right. experienced it themselves. I, I don't know. Maybe they're in their ivory towers. I really don't know. Do but I do know what's yeah. happening at the, at, the, at the ground level. And I just think this is woefully inadequate. Yep. And the whole system needs to be overhauled. Yes, it is true that we need to address the issues of the fact that there aren't enough jobs to go around. Um, and that's, that's, that's a whole other separate issue. But in the meantime, while hopefully governments and businesses and non-for-profits tackle, and they should do it together, tackle the issue of trying to create more jobs, at the same time, that means that for the foreseeable future, there's still going to be hundreds of thousands of people in Australia, they're going to be stuck on New Start or other payments, and we need to look at a welfare system that is going to give them hope that is going to give them somewhere that they know that the government is saying, hey, you know, we know you're in this difficulty, we care about you, and we really, really want to help you. Yeah. And that's the message that I hope that whoever gets in power next, whoever they may be, will they listen to the people at the bottom rung of society? Will they listen or will they ignore them? That's all I want to say. <laughs> Seven and
and on New Start. In 1996, I owned my own business. I owned my own home until my husband walked out, leaving me with nothing but my kids and one on the way. I've been on New Start since being transferred over from parenting payments single at the beginning of 2013. Before this, I was studying to better my chances of gaining employment, but this fell by the wayside because once being transferred, I could no longer afford the cost of study. In fact, I could no longer afford much of anything. Yeah. yeah. The yeah. transfer cost me $230 a fortnight out of my income. Yeah. This meant I needed to give up study and focus on keeping a roof over mine and my son's head. I was unable to afford the rent on the place I've been living in for five years, and thus started three years of going from place to place to place. Yeah. Never being able to settle because the rent kept going up, my income didn't. Yeah, yeah. yeah. My health suffered, yeah. and so did my sons. I withdrew from many things. Never being able to afford to meet up with friends or attend functions. Yeah. My son stopped asking me for money to go on school excursions, to go to friends' birthday parties, to go to the skate rink. Yeah. Anything that costs money, really. He just yeah. stopped asking. Things just kept getting worse. Everything kept rising in cost, but my income remained the same. I started skipping meals to try and make ends meet. No hope of finding work, I was too old. Even though I owned my own business, spent five years volunteering at my son's school, and while at TAFE I helped other students use the computers, copied items and did other stuff for the lecturers, None of it counted when trying to find work because I had no work, recent work history. Yeah. I do all the right things. I attend my appointments. I do their in-house courses, such as learning to write a resume, how to talk when <laughs> attending an interview, <laughs> what to wear at an interview, etc. <laughs> None of which has helped me in any way. I now pay 75% of my income on rent. I struggle to pay the gas, yeah. Electricity, yeah. internet, phone, all of which are needed. Yeah. I gave up a long time ago on eating healthy. I now eat whatever I can get when I can get it. Three meals a day are a forgotten luxury for me. Yeah. Yes, that's so true. I became so disheartened that I started having thoughts of ending it all. I kept thinking that maybe things would be better for my son if I was not here holding him back. But instead of giving up, I decided to help others in the same situation as me. I started at my own charity. Becoming incorporated, got all the necessary coverage needed, and now delivered close on 100 hampers a week. Yay! I spend close on 50 hours a week picking up items, sorting, bagging, packing and delivering. But none of this counts towards my volunteer hours. No, shame, 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 shame. shame. This is because the base for the charity is my home. Shame. So I can't run a charity from my home, but I can run a business from my home. Bureaucracy. And the other, the other, other funny thing is that um, I can offer Volunteer hours to anybody else that needs them. What a joke! I'm registered with Centrelink as a, a you know a, a um, registered charity with them. Make your week. So they can send people to me. Job network agencies can send people to me, but I can't use it for me. Stupid. No. <coughs> Bureaucracy in place. I'd like to ask the MPs that have attended today three questions. What is your party going to do to alleviate the stress of housing for those on welfare that rent? Yeah. Yeah. Will your party raise new start to be at least level with the poverty line instead of 35% of the <laughs> Will your party change the system to acknowledge those that take it upon themselves to start up a not-for-profit organisation 
that helps those in need and do not receive payment from their work. Long-term unemployment is not something that you can really plan for. And it's also totally soul-destroying when the payment that you're expected to subsist on, even when on a medical incapacity for work, forces you so deep into poverty that you don't answer your door or even your mail anymore. And you have to draw on any super that you may have accumulated to that point, and you still have your car repossessed because your insurance refused to pay out. And now you're looking at bankruptcy because how could you ever expect to pay back the $40,000 you're in the hole for yeah. after being unemployed and trying to survive on new start for over three years? <coughs> you have to tell your child over and over and over and over know that you can't afford to give the money for that to at least stop bothering to even ask. And you see all the weight of poverty on your child's shoulders by no fault of their own, and with little uh, knowledge of it by the general public. And that is only because the people on welfare are so often and easily demonised and portrayed as lazy and failures, and lacking only in motivation and drive, rather than the actual situation that they found themselves in, which is one of unequal opportunity and high unemployment. You only have to look to any recent story or an current event about people on welfare and the treatment of people like Duncan Storer on Q&A to see that the general public's perception of the unemployed is that they are lazy, unmotivated, and unable to find a secure job. And the most common misconception is that the pool of unemployed people is always the same pool of unemployed people. Yeah. When we know that people move in and out of unemployment and poverty. We also have the highest unemployment in the country here in South Australia, and yet even more and more mutual obligations are being added to the endless and pointless hoops that are, are required to be jumped through in order to secure this mediocre income. Yes. participated for a longer time in the workforce than out during my adult life, I really, I really can't conceive of how any of the mutual obligations that are required by Centrelink or my GST to actually achieve anything in the way of finding work. The assumption in all of these mutual obligations is that people would somehow prefer to live in abject poverty and have to sell their personal possessions or simply have them repossessed like my car yeah. rather than work and have some financial security. I've been left so totally frustrated that by the process one day I, like a total bogan, lost it in a Centrelink office. It was a ridiculous set of circumstances and it was a period of time where the SMS notifications from Centrelink weren't working. It was just after I'd gone to Centrelink to apply for a payment thinking that it would be parenting payment single only to be told that legislation had changed and I would be applying for New Start. Even though I'd left a three-year career to care for my teenager, who was severely self-harming on the point of suicide, mm -hmm. I would have to wait for a medical exemption. Shameful. During that time, I would be required to take part in all of those mutual obligations, and this included appointments with JSP. Still, which I cannot understand the usefulness to the process of job hunting, other than frustrating those who were in the system. Those notifications are our only notifications that we rely on for our appointment. One, re one morning I received a notification to advise me, a notification that worked once, <coughs> that my payment had been suspended because I had not attended a JSP appointment. I called Centrelink to advise them that I had not been advised of the appointment. Centrelink told me it didn't matter, but the fact that I'd missed the appointment meant that they couldn't reinstate my payment over the phone and I would have to attend my local Centrelink office. So I made this 15 minute drive to my local office and I lined up. When I got to the front of the line, Centrelink told me they would not deal with me as I'd missed the JSP appointment. I would need to go to my JSP office. Yep. Luckily at the time, it was only on the other side of the Westfield Marion car park that my JSP was on. So I went over to them 
And the lady said, just advise me. They couldn't help me because Centrelink had uh, uh, halted my payment. I would need to call a number in Victoria, their main office, to arrange another appointment. As soon as I walked out of the JSP office, I called the number in Victoria. The lady in the office told me they could not reinstate my payment until I had an attended an appointment with my JSP. I was desperate for money that day. I'd been days, as you all can relate, without money on that day. I was told it didn't matter and I would have to attend the appointment at 9 a.m. the next morning. So I arrived at 9 a.m. the next morning at my JSP office and they told me, unfortunately, Centrelink had removed me from their system. They wouldn't see me for the appointment at 9 a.m. I would have to go back to Centrelink. They would have to put me back in the JSP system, at which time I could call the number in Victoria again and they could make another appointment. I was livid. Yes. I was told no one set in terms to leave their office. I know I drove the short distance back to Centrelink and when it came time for me at the front of the queue, I promptly lost my shit. This is how the system degrades you. Yep. A social worker, because of my emotional distress, came straight to the front of the line, saw me at the front of the queue, mm -hmm. and I had money in my account within a matter of hours. Mm -hmm. This is the amount of control that these people yes. have over yes. your life. Yes. They make you feel like you have to beg for the dignity of money to pay for your rent and yep. them food to buy for your family. Yep. Make no mistake, I loved my job. I loved being employed. I loved the feeling of community in my colleagues and I loved the feeling of providing service to my customers and my company as an employee. I felt pride in my paychecks and I enjoyed the ability to take my son out into society and to be feel to feel as though we were participating in that society. But now I feel nothing but worthlessness. I used to see a light at the end of the tunnel. But I also have disabilities and injuries, those which have multiplied since I have been unemployed. I have subacromial bursitis with carpal tunnel in both of my hands, and I also have problems with my ulna, which means I suffer with constant pain every day, and I have numbness in my hands and my fingers, and I'm losing strength and feeling in my hands as a result. Because of my anxiety and depression, I suffer with agoraphobia, so leaving the house can be incredibly difficult. Mm -hmm. And it's rarely done on time. What I'd like to ask the panel today is how am I expected to recover from my illnesses and get myself back into the workforce when I have little to no support? What employer is going to give me the security and the flexibility that I need as a disabled sole parent and carer of my son? Yep. What am I supposed to do? That's something like this but I've never seen it before so this is amazing. Um, yeah so I grew up in quite a poor and unstable household. Uh, what Kat said about the three meals a day being a, a forgotten luxury that brought back memories definitely. So I was one of the lucky ones because I had aunts and uncles that were quite well off. They helped me where they could and yeah um, I moved out of home at nearly 16 due to unsafe living circumstances, which put me on the living away from home allowance. So I started working as soon as I could and sometimes worked two jobs while going to school and doing a vet course, which was uh, yeah, difficult. But yeah, pulled through and now I'm doing media and arts in a double degree at uni. So through these experiences I've learned about many stereotypes and misconceptions about low income people and misconceptions about problems in our communities. So the common ones for me are you're too young to have problems, then why have you changed to people who ask for it, you're only feeding a habit. X, Y, and Z are poor because they're lazy and don't want to work. Why do X and Y complain and whinge when they get Z from the government? And etc. So, I'll tell you a bit today about why these misconceptions are dangerous and why it's dangerous to spread them. 
Um, sorry. The biggest example I have for why this is dangerous is because we're now in a system that's built on these misconceptions. So young people who can't find work at the moment, even those who job hunt daily, even those who applied for a hundred jobs in a row and not got a single interview, they're still caught in patronising job seeking programs and work for the doll programs where in a lot of sites they're doing meaningless and unskilled work. Mm. Either that or they get put in certificates that um, <coughs> the job network doesn't really tell them that when you take that to an employer on a resume, they don't really recognise it because yeah. it's not uni or tape. Yeah. So the common idea is that all people in job agencies and work for the doll programs don't want to work. And this is because it's a blanket solution. It doesn't distinguish between those people who are searching for 100 jobs at a time. It doesn't distinguish between people who are trying to find work but have disabilities. It's not saved as a last resort. It's just this one solution, solution for everyone. So meanwhile, young people lucky enough to find work compete for jobs below minimum wage, some of which are cash in hand, and some of which have very few hours, and many of which demand many hours from the youngest employees, because they're the cheapest employees, giving school students no choice on whether or not to work 20 hours a week. So, <coughs> sorry. Yeah, this also makes job seekers in the next age group more resentful. And this is young workers do this during and after the hours and hours of unpaid work in volunteering and internships mm -hmm. to try to get more work experience. So people in these poorer areas, people on low income, we have no illusions about what we're living in. So generations of unemployment and poverty in a lot of areas have led to more crime, addiction and death. But what does the government decide to do about this? In in introduce the basics card. Oh. And I can tell you from a lot of different experiences this is not a solution. <coughs> First thing is addicts. Okay, I've been told, oh, you know, if you cut their access to money, you'll cut their access to their substances. This will save lives, right? <laughs> no, I. I get the money from somewhere else. Absolutely. <laughs> and and sell their children. Else. The children are the ones that sell. Yes, exactly. It's from us. Yes. I won't name who, but I've lived with addicts. I've had mon money stolen from me from addicts. I've had <laughs> money borrowed from me that I couldn't afford to lend from addicts. And that is because they didn't have enough money to begin with. Now imagine <coughs> what it's going to do to the people around those people with addictions mm. when you cut off half of their money and don't institute <coughs> every, anything like rehab centres or anything like that. Yes. Yeah. Which, you know, that this is this fabulous, great idea. Do you know what? How, 
rather than encouraging people to take control of their own budget, their own, budget, their yeah. own finances, we are going to, we're going to suck you into this fabulous hey get a set of steak knives basics card <laughs> in centering offices yep. yeah. um, to try and encourage to you know <coughs> so is the system designed to support people no. or is it actually designed to disempower people? Um, yes. I'm, at the moment, I'm, I'm, there's a debate I reckon we could have about whether or not it's one or the other. Because mm -hmm. it's pushing people down, it's not lifting them up or supporting them. Yeah. 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 So yeah, instead of introducing financial planning programs or anything like that, let's just put you on this really patronising allowance system. Anyway. Uh, the biggest one we get is you don't know how lucky you are, why you're whinging when you've got it so good in so many... It's a bit pop out, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, it is, because uh, I know how lucky I am, and no one has ever felt as lucky as the poor have, because I can't even describe how much it means to us when we do something like finding a dollar on the ground, someone gives us food, someone gives us clothes. That is, I actually get, like, when people give me things now, I've been trying to explain to my family that I, I just can't. I can't even accept it because to them it's a normal thing and to me it's massive. Yeah. So no one, no one knows what it's like to feel as lucky as we do. But the reason we whinge and complain is we're not fighting just for ourselves, we're fighting for each other. We're fighting for each other. Jackie's um, a financial counsellor at the uh, Salvos, and she's going to put, I guess, the sum of what we heard about how low a um, number of the sensing payments have become into perspective. So, yes. thank you, Jackie. Hi, I'm Jackie. I'm a financial, financial counsellor and have been for seven years. I started off um, as a volunteer, did my degree in started off as a volunteer, managed to pay work. So I'm not in the same position as you are. I've admitted you, my hours have been reduced. I lost a job through lack of funding to non church organisations. So um, I'm still lucky to pick up 10 hours a week. I'm also entitled to a part payment of the age pension. But unfortunately, thanks to the Liberal government, that will then be cut off when the new, if they get re-elected. And I believe Labor are also going to continue with the cuts. Mm -hmm. I could be wrong. I'd like to be corrected if I am. Um, I'm on the opposite side to you. I see you all. I hear your stories. I see up to three clients a day, and it's not covering half of what is needed out here. We've got United Communities, we've got Living Community Care, we've got some full-time workers. And we see, on a full day, we can see up to four clients a day, and each one of you has a different story. Some of you have houses and you've just lost your job. You've lived on your savings because you didn't know you were entitled to a settling payment. You've got credit cards that you were able to afford when you were working. All of a sudden, you can't afford them anymore. Yeah. You don't know what to do. So we can negotiate and do things for you. But that's not a solution in the long term. You know, we need to get you back into work. Out of the clients I say, I would say 75% want to work. They really do. Give them a job today that they think they, they could handle, they'd be in there like this. <laughs> who don't want to work. And we all know that. We can't deny it. But they're few. We've got people on New Star. He's got three children to support. He's that badly injured. He misses out on the DSP by one point. Yeah. When I first started seeing him, he was $395 
minus every fortnight. Yeah. Yep. Minus 395. We have now managed to negotiate hard uh, payments for him, and he's minus $62. And that's without being able to afford the full quality of food yep. and clothing yeah. required for those children. Yeah. Don't forget that when you apply for a disability support pension, you have to acquire a certain number of points when you're assessed for the GSP. Yeah. It was a bit different. I fought for five and a half years to get on disability support pension things have changed. And do you know how it can come down to? One misquoted or miswritten yep. sentence on the application by a doctor. Yep. Yep. The assessing doctor is usually a Commonwealth government doctor. So I'm just working for the government to cut as much money down as possible. I also have another client who has had a mental breakdown three or four years ago. She's trying to pay her own house off. She's been unable to gain employment. She's just finished her aged care worker um, certificate. She's $595 behind the eight ball every fortnight. Yeah. $595. Because she's buying her own home, she doesn't get rent assistance. Yeah. Now, the people who are feeding the land, the greedy landlords, they get rent assistance. Yeah. The, landlords, the landlords keep putting the rents up. Yep. The average rental for my clients minimum is two hundred and fifty dollars a week. A week. A week. So that's five hundred dollars out of five hundred and sixty-two dollars a fortnight. In, from then on, yes? I don't know if people are aware, but if you are in a single, like, or in, if you're a single person, um, and you previously owned a home with anyone before, you cannot get rent assistance. I paid $320 a week for my home to live in with my two children because my husband walked out on me. This is not fair. That's, right. that's not true. You're entitled to it. I've got, no, I, no, I've got no, my own no. home and I, I can get rental assistance. No, I've never heard that. that. I left my partner in a domestic violence situation and the women and children are the ones who suffer in these situations, yeah. anti poverty, etc. That's something I will really take up and find out the reason for that. Yeah. 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 Section of it is true or not. Depends on which office you go to and who you're speaking to because every time you go into the office, you'll get a different yeah. piece of information. That's right. And that's right. the right. other yeah. issue is when people try to find out what they want and need and what they're entitled to, depending on who answers the phone, nobody knows anything. Yeah. And, and, and so much wrong information. I'm also very lucky. I have a daughter who works for Centrally and who also then previously worked for Job Network. So she's very aware of what's going on and I get a lot of information that you know I can really check up on so I'm, I'm quite assured of things. Um, so that's two of my clients. But I think that people who are trying to save their own home should at least have three months rental assistance to begin with. Or mothers with yeah. husbands leave them and with their children in the family home. Male, again, people who should be getting child support need to have a better result from the child support um, department as well. Because so many men are actually declaring that they're not earning or can't find or are up, give up their jobs on Centrelink to stop paying child support. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Centrelink cut me off of my child ta tax, family tax benefits without me knowing, uh, whilst I was in a family situation, DV situation, and when I finally left the situation, I, after, I think, the fifth trip to Centrelink office, finally got informed that, oh, well, because it's DV, we can give you a child tax exemption where I don't have to worry about uh, the, dealing with it with the father. But unless you get that piece of information after maybe the fourth or fifth trip, which by that time you probably home with the children in the car somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> when I do an income expenditure, most of the money goes to rent, electricity, gas, 
And we all know now that um, another organisation today has raised their electricity rates by 10%. Mm -hmm. You all know you're entitled to an each concession for $400, which is not covering what people want. We've got clients with eight, nine, ten thousand dollars $10,000 electricity bills. So it's just impossible for people in this state at this time of life that are on a government benefit to actually live. The other week, did anybody see the Paul Pithero um, on the New Start allowance where they went and the expectation that somebody on New Start should live in a motel room with four other people and live on sausages all week. Yep. The whole concept was degrading to anybody that is unemployed. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Well, um, now it's time for um, the Q and A. Uh, we don't have an enormous amount of time, but we're going to try to um, cover like as many different issues as possible. And I think probably like a really nice way to start, given particularly Jackie's and speech, but all the other speeches as well, is um, New Start allowance. Um, we know that it's now been 22 years since New Start was last raised in real terms. We now have business as well as welfare groups that have come out and called for it and at least $50 per week increase into the payment. So, um, which of you are going to commit to raising uh, um, New Start? We might start with the um, um, Senator Randall, thank, um, thank you very much, Paz, um, and thank you to everybody that's firstly come and, uh, and turned out, and particularly to the people that have contributed um, with your stories. Uh, you're all very capable, competent, clear-thinking people that deserve uh, a good turnout in life, and certainly um, Anthony your story <clears throat> is compelling because I think that you uh, uh, said, said it for everybody. And I just, I wrote it down when you said it. There's just not enough jobs to go around. Um, so the issue that we have is to try and grow an economy which there is jobs to go around. Where there are more jobs for each and every one of you. You've heard a saying, a rising tide lifts all boats. Well, that's exactly right. Uh, if you apply it to the job scheme, <laughs> but if you apply it to the job scheme, if, you're there, if there are more jobs and better paying jobs, it means that there are opportunities free up for everybody with every skill level along the line. The, I cannot understate the importance for the government to get its budget back in order. May I suggest a panel of single mothers, they'll have it sorted yeah. in a week. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. and have a chat with you. I'm happy to put the government's position, you know, but if you, if, you, if we're going to have an interaction, let's have a meaningful one, which ones that I can try and give you some answers. Yeah. I've got a question. So, Sean, the, the question was, you know, would yeah. the government commit was, to and raising I, well, allowance? And I was really about to answer it yeah. when I was offered all the help, which is good. <laughs> um, so there are, there is an aspiration by this government to provide a better safety net for people. And safety net meaning more more money in line with the cost of living. Now, what I find, you know, a, a, a real blow for each and every one of you in this room is the fact that your electricity is going to cost more as of the 1st of July. And I've just heard the stories, and I hear the stories in my, in my working life, in my, the people that I come up, and I spend a lot of time in this, in this area, as long with Nick, he does too. But we, we both know that that will just put a... Don't try and draw me into it. Do you have any questions, mate? Come to me in due course. Do you don't spend much time here? 
That, that was the inference. That was the inference. I mean, we, we spend a lot of time here listening to these stories. Um, so I guess uh, what, what I can take from that is that it's just going to get harder from here on out. It's not going to get easier. But the importance, and you talk about being a single mother and balancing your budget. Can I tell you a government has got sectors, it's called education, it's got health, it's got defence, it's got all these places and you've so got, so you've got, you've got food, and health and <laughs> well they're expenditure areas, like it or lump it, it costs, well one submarine more can employ a lot more people, so let's go the other way, let's go the other way where we live, we, live, we, we give people opportunities for work building submarines, rather than not building a submarine and giving it not creating any work. So, so if you create the projects and if you create the environment where small business can operate, we've got 140,000 small businesses who employ people that make coffee, that wait tables, that work in hotels. Are you going to raise, the question is just, about raising well, I, new stuff? Am I on a time limit? Yes. 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 <laughs> <laughs> Fifteen-minute window, mate. Like doctors. We get, we get them on. You, you're quite, you're quite welcome to call me. I'm happy that I'm your mate, but you're quite welcome to call me Sean. That's my name. My mother gave it to me. I'm happy to use it. So, so in short, I am not. I'm. I am not the minister responsible for applying when. The new start allowance is raised. Well, the minister responsible, KPMG, um, released a report one week before the federal budget calling for a $50 a week increase. And the minister responsible, Christian um, Porter, said the cost of doing that would be astonishing. Do you agree? Well, it would be probably eye watering. You know, what, whatever you, you'd like to put, the, ma the quantum of doing that. Can I answer these questions? Actually, um, hi everyone. My name is Muhammad Ali. I'm an independent senator. Uh, uh, sorry, Australia is actually really high. Muhammad, sorry. Yes. We're going to. Um, because they're not going to avoid questions. They're not going to. No, I'm not avoiding questions. Let's finish. We're going to get the rest of the candidates um, to answer this. Question, and then so that's I'm good. So, I'm fed up so with this government, you know? I voted when you changed it. Hey, hey, hey. Can I show, can I make a comment, or are you finish? No, well, I'll just finish up. The, okay. Christian Porter has made his comment mm -hmm. about New Start. Um, for me personally, would I like to see it? Would every politician, the 226 that exist in Parliament, uh, of course they'd like to see those things. Uh, uh, increased more and more, and in line with with indexation. But you you, you you have to you have to apply when you're in charge of a budget. As you well know, the point was made here about this. You've got to try and make things go around to those places in which you think uh, is of the most need. Now, you you would have your own view. I could go to another forum of disabled people and with the NDIS and they would have their views. C can I say, me, I, I think... If, if, so, if that case, Sean, if that's the case that most ministers would like to see the new start raised, then why... No, no, I'm saying most... I would say every politician, no, every politician in Australia in would love case, to see new start raised. why has your particular party decided to raise the qualification of a small business so that the large businesses earning billions of dollars profit every year can get a tax cut when yeah. you can't afford to give twenty dollars a week to the Well the modelling on that shows that it, and I have a small business. Uh, and if I have uh, so if I'm just clarify small more, more profitable. Yeah. If I'm more profitable, I'm likely to spend more money with more people and to grow the business. And that's the fact of it. And that's what happened. And that's that's. I think we're going to go on to Robert now. Um, well, firstly, thank you all for sharing your experiences. And to to directly answer your question about where our party sits on. Um, new start, youth allowance. Yes, we do support increasing it. One of the <laughs>
for a long time. My colleague Rachel Seward is a big advocate in this space. Um, the thing that people say when we talk about increasing New Start, and you know, Sean's made these comments, how do we pay for it? Well, you know, quite frankly, budgets are about priorities. And why is it that in our country we can afford a tax break for the big end of town, but we can't afford to provide support for people in this country who are doing it tough? We found, you know, we found $50 billion for submarines, yet we can't find money to increase new stuff. You know, we need to be able to we need to be able to put some money into this. I'm not. I'm not. No. I'm, I'm not. I'm not no. Well, hang on. Well, actually, actually, let me finish. Um, no, we're not against funding for submarines. However, $50 billion, we don't need 12 submarines. And the reality, is, the reality is, in this country, we seem to always be able to find billions and billions of dollars for defence spending, but we can't seem to find it when it comes to investing in support for people who need yeah. it. So it's our part to I'm committed to the uh, Productivity Commission reviewing the rates of new start. Well, if thanks it gets for announcing my policy. But, <laughs> but <laughs> stealing, my, <laughs> stealing my, my... How about I answer my questions for me? You, Sean had a go at it, now you're having a go at it. Do we, no, I, I, can answer, it. I can answer do, it for myself. Do we need a review to tell us that well, new well, start's too well, low? Pat, I don't need a preamble. You didn't give a preamble for Sean. No, That's his job. Or for uh, uh, Robert. Okay, He's a facilitator. It's his job. Um, first of all, thanks for the contributions, and they, and they were uh, passionate and well spoken. And uh, um, many of the problems that are raised in them were not unknown to me because my office does assembly issues every day, and particularly in relation to access to the DSP and other um, issues uh, being breached and that sort of thing. Uh, I. Uh, I guess have some idea about how frustrating it is because my office deals with many of these issues. If you are having problems with Centrelink, um, feel free to come down to the office and see us and we will do our best to facilitate dealing with them because they are at times a very hard institution to deal with, and particularly if you have problems like uh, the young lady had where you, you know, you one, Wait, one person, you reckon you can help 10,000 mums? Like, yeah. you're on your yeah. way. Yeah. You're on your way. Yeah. Yeah. You're on your way. 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 You're on Come down to my office, in all seriousness. Yeah. I, I will, so we will. Yeah. I've got friends who have got their house up for sale. They're the quintessential all-Australian family <coughs> who he actually has a very um, impressive line of work working yeah. on oil rigs, making yeah. salt water of all things. But the work dried yeah. up. Yeah. And after six years, don't nod like that. Because they've been trying to get hold of Centrelink benefits, but because of some ridiculous paperwork regarding the fact that they still have a company, mm. Centrelink won't pay them. They've had appeals in the works yeah. for more than 18 months. Yeah. They have been trying to get this support, and they, ha they cannot get these appeals finalised by Centrelink. And every time they've approached your office, They've been told that you won't help them out until the appeals are finished, but Centrelink won't finish out their appeals. Well, and now uh, their house is up for sale, yeah. and they're looking, well, at, they're they're looking they're at jumping they're the ditch back to New Zealand because it's better over there than here for them. Well, I guess there's two issues. There's the issues if you're currently on Centrelink um, and you're having issues with accessing systems being breached by JSAs, and all I was saying is <coughs> if you are having difficulties, come to my office, we'll endeavour to do our best. Uh, there are a second group of workers, and, and these people may be in that group. And I was down the other day with a group of workers that are being made redundant. Uh, and so we got Centrelink to come down and give them a briefing about uh, accessing benefits. And it is extraordinarily hard. If you are coming out of particularly a high-paid profession like uh, uh, the oil rigs, uh, you, are, you are made there are very long waiting times, very long waiting times, 
uh, if you get any sort of redundancy. It's not just the waiting time. A number of times you've been down the centre and gone. That's right. So there's a liquid. Keep it there's, there's also a liquid access test. There's also a liquid access test. Like liquid access test. But what we've said, and as Paz uh, said in his preamble, what we've said is we will review the adequacy of new start with a view to two things. With a view to two things. Alleviating poverty and encouraging work. Now, uh, as Paz points what does out, that mean exactly mean yeah, what does that well, mean? well, it means we'll review the adequacy. Now, when you say there hasn't been an increase in New Start in 22 years, well, the last time that happened was under a Labor government. So we're giving a review. We're, giving, we're, we're undertaking that a review into the adequacy of it. To you know, we know it's in adequacy. Can, can I just ask, with the review, will you? And here's the thing that is a big, big, big bugbear for me because I used to be a union organiser for the public sector. Yeah. I have a hell of a lot of respect for the professionals that we engage in state and, and Commonwealth public sector that Liberal governments like to keep sacking. Um, and making redundant and moving around, what would be really nice in any kind of, re of review, because there are professionals who work with us. Centrelink is this incredibly amazing resource if we want to use it as such. Yeah. It would be fabulous for Labor to commit to a review networking with the people that actually use the organism and the people who work with them, the professionals, the social workers, the uh, community workers, the psychologists, the GPs, the nurse practitioners, the teachers, the people in the communities that actually work with people who have to live on these absolute pittance. Not because all of these services, excuse me, not all of these services where the government. system is broken. No. Yes. Just in, okay. just in regard Because to, that yeah. would be, if you're going to review anything, what really gives me the irritants is when there's a review and they speak to some someone who's like a top tier manager, director somewhere, who's never seen a, or met or talked or had a conversation with anyone on Centrelink benefit in their in their, you know, and I just think We've got these incredibly talented people working out there in not-for-profits, community organisations that we need to be working with who will actually give a real picture to the what, how bad the situation is across the country to no. afford dignity Can we to people. Just, just, on, well, just on that, I mean, uh, and Paz and I have discussed this before, one of the, uh, I think, successful things that was put in place in the last Labor government was what, what was called wraparound services. They've all now been removed, but wraparound services sought to bring all of those services into Centrelink, so you only had to see, if you like, you had the one appointment and the services came to the individual, yes. uh, and there was sort of a case management type approach that worked, rather than having everybody in a system where um, some would describe it as broken, uh, at, the very at, at the very least, it's very hard to access, and I've met many people with experiences like yours, so I'm, I'm not saying it, it works every time. Um, but if you bring people together, um, you have a better, much those service providers, the not-for-profits, you have a much better chance of it working than if they're all in their separate offices and <coughs> A lot of the NGOs are picking up the slack and doing all the yeah. hard work that these .gov.au's and .org's should be doing, <laughs> and they're getting all of the funding. All right, the people on the street are not seeing what's going on. They're not. I'm not seeing any love. I don't feel it. Yeah. And not only that, I think depending on the public, having organised them to link workers, under the Howard government there were KPIs, uh, key performance indicators. So if you've got your job, if you're working for Centrelink, you have a job, that's great. But if you if you want to keep your job, you have to breach a certain number of people per week. Now, if that was happening under Howard then, uh, you know, if there were breaching pay people, you know, workers were going off um, on, you know, sick leave all the time because they just couldn't bring themselves to hurt any more people. So, Danny, uh, sorry, we do have quite a few issues yeah. to get through yeah. today. Um, yeah. um, so, Nick, if I understand you correctly, Labor will review the rates of new staff yeah. and you can't guarantee the rates to new staff. No, no, but that's, that's, yeah, that's right. What I said was, we review it with an eye to two factors. Alleviating yeah. poverty and encouraging work. Ah, uh, but no guarantee raised. No guarantee. Right. That's very disappointing. Sorry. Yeah. Arty. Hi. Hi, Marty. Um, I'm a bit nervous. Uh, yes or no? Does the Australian Progressives plan to raise new start? Yes, to at minimum the poverty line. Um, <laughs> 
rundown on the party is an example of the kind of party that they are. Um, I'm 23, I'm a single mum, and I'm on welfare, and I'm running for the Senate. And my brother is back. Raising new start, we should be making job networks controlled. We should actually be putting money into helping people get training, not paying thousands of dollars to gain the training needed to actually get the skills to get a job. And I'm going to keep it simple because we've only got a short period of time. Yeah. Oh, thank you, Pat. It's good to be here. Um, family first. Our motto is very sim simple. It's uh, every family. Uh, a job and a house. Um, jobs and houses has been my thing now for since 1980. I've been helping particularly young people get trades. I come from the building industry, so I've, I've helped an enormous lot of young people get jobs, particularly up in this area, apprenticeships and that sort of thing. And it got that way where anyone wanted a job, they'd ring Leon Biner on 5AA and then they'd give, they'd give Leon my, my phone number. Uh, the other thing was houses. I did a lot of um, uh, built a lot of houses on the other side of Main North Road, um, which is that way. Golden Road, yeah. Over that one. It used to be called Smithfield East, and then it got rezoned to Springfield, Springfield, Springvale Gardens or something, um, Blake's Crossing, Blakeview. And it was very interesting that the land that was vacant from, from Smithfield, you know, virtually all the way to Balaclava, and the land was vacant and it was really cheap. And we just kept building houses. And I remember very, very clearly, because um, we worked with a guy called Gary Storkey at New Start uh, Finance, the State Government Finance Agency. We were providing brand new houses for people on unemployment benefits. They could buy their own house, a house and land package across the road in Smithfield East. Um, it wasn't a big house, but it was their own house. It had a carport, three bedrooms, and bathroom, and so on. Bob, I'm going to run out of battery here. Can you answer the question, please? <laughs> sure. We'll get into that. And yes, sir. So, jobs and houses, you know, I have no problem. We've got, we have two main policy areas of jobs and houses. The first one, would Family First support uh, a raise in the uh, Centrelink payment? Absolutely, we definitely would, on one condition, and that is that anybody who would, wanted to get a job as well had no impact on their Centrelink payments for a minimum of two years. So that you could, you could go and get a job to do whatever you like for a minimum of two years and it would not affect or impact your Centrelink payments. The second thing we would do when it comes to houses, the, this, uh, the land across the road at Smithfield um, East, the state government realised that they could actually make some money out of this by what they call rezoning. So they'd stop uh, people building houses and then drip feed the blocks out, you know, two and three at a time and, and increase the price from was then thirty forty thousand dollars for a house and land package in uh, yes. How much sorry? Twenty nine thousand yeah, dollars? Yeah. And now you've your house costs less right, yes, yeah. than what your block of land does. Exactly. And there's absolutely and I'll tell you there's absolutely no reason whatsoever that a block of land should still be only thirty or forty thousand. Right. But what they do, they restrict it and they drip feed it out one block, two blocks at a time. And yeah, charge. but it's investors like yourself who drove the prices up in the first place. Absolutely yeah. not. We did not rezone the land and we objected to it. We, <coughs> uh, we vehemently objected to it. We said, don't do that. All it will do is force the price up and then people will not be able to afford to own their own home. And for, like I said, we used to get people into their houses on unemployment benefits. We're running time on time, so we can move on to Sky. Sky, what is the Nick Xenophon team's position on raising new start allowance? Thank you, Paz, and thank you to everyone who spoke today. I'll, I'll be direct with you because I think you deserve that. Um, the Nick Xenophon team, we don't have a final position in relation to raising the new start allowance dollars a week. But um, what I'll do, I'm going to sit down with the group and I undertake to get back to you all through Paz about our final position because you deserve to know before polling day where we stand on that. Now, it was Andrew who pointed out that we've got two, two issues here. We've got not enough jobs to go around, and we've got inadequate supports for people who are on Centrelink payments. So, um, Sarah, when you spoke about your experience, that you had to essentially have a meltdown in a Centrelink office to get to fix their mistake. It wasn't anything you had done, it was their mistake. And that was only on one day. Yeah. Yeah. That's like, totally... I've had my payments suspended and had 
had to have, had to have it re reinstated more than one time. Yeah. Yeah, that yeah. was just one time. And that's just one time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that, that shouldn't be happening to you, and that shouldn't be happening that's to any time. of you. That's a big that's department, and it happens all the time. All the time. And what Nick, Nick mentioned earlier about being able to contact a local member, don't forget that you've got 11 House of Reps members in South Australia and 12 Senators, and each of those officers have a direct line into Centrelink. Yeah. So that if any of you... Well, actually, that's been that. shut down by the government. <laughs> <laughs> so we used, to, we used to have a liaison person who, if someone came you know, with a particular difficult issue, we used to be able to ring up the one person. The government got rid of that. So now you, you know, in, in theory, you're supposed to go through the same process as everybody else does. Um, but, you know, and why did Centrelink get, get rid of Aboriginal so cultural awareness offices? Pets, I've got a question. I've got a question. I, I gotta say, everybody sprang it up and said what the position was and you know, to mm. much you, you the Xenophon party's gotta stop sitting on the fence on everything. Yes, they've got can no answer the question. Can I just uh, front, answer front up and answer the question oh, like all of us have. You can't you can't not have a position because we're not getting together again until the election, are we? No. So you need to know what you're voting for. Sky, um the Nick Xenophon team has Unlike there's a number of policy positions already, unlike a range of areas, we were working through the website the other day over coffee, um, and, and like a number of major <coughs> organisations have spent years and years calling, um, calling attention to how low new studies, the Business Council of Australia, ACOS, the Australian Council of Trade Unions, St Vinnie's, the Salvation Army, why doesn't the Nick Xenophon team have a position on Newstart yet? We've got one. You're not you are coming here. Yeah, well, Nick's, been, Nick's been one um, amongst 226 for, for nearly eight years now. And the reason behind him forming the party is so that he does have a team around him and he's got the numbers to get some of these this work done. So I know I understand that it's disappointing and, I, and I'm not going to try and dance over that, but that's why I've said I'll get back to you all through PAS so that you can have our position before the election. Okay, um, we've got some more questions. Um, so... Uh, I've got Therese, then Tanya, then Jackie, and then Sue, and we've got to keep to really strict limits, and please, no interjecting that. I don't like everyone feeling pretty passionate today, but we'll try to get to like as many people as possible. So Therese first. Thank you. Therese Evans, National Council of Single Mothers and Their Children. First of all, I would like to thank the Cinephon team, the Lambs, and Nick Xenophon for their support for blocking uh, family payments. Essential. Yes, thank you. To you is Sean regarding the, the trickle down effect. In, in 2005-2006 we had record um, surpluses, low unemployment and the government introduced their policy to force sole parents onto um, new staff. So I, I, I suppose I share the restlessness around this sort of trickle down growing the pie because there's a group that just always seem to miss out. Yeah. 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 I, 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 yeah, sit, sit down. Yeah. Oh, look, I, I concur with you. I think uh, back in those in that time, we did miss an opportunity, and there has been opportunities missed since then, um, to reform what New Start is, um, and to make it something a better fit for for your organisation. So, I, opportunity lost. Yes, I think so. What happens now? is very much dependent on how we are able to implement our program of jobs and the growth in our economy. <laughs> All right? Because it does relate to getting back into surplus. Now, you know in your own households, if you've got spare cash, you can put it into areas in which of most need. Sure. Like offshore? We, we all understand oh, that. Because, because, because I, don't I, don't I think people who well, have low the incomes, I think people who so have low, low incomes are some of the best money budgeters in the world. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 But, but if yours, we were in that prime time and you, you took a whack to solve parents. So it's really hard for us now to sit and listen to you and say when we get back there, we will help you out. And just one last word around sole parents and New Start. New Start is unemployed. 
And I think if you're raising a child, you're not jobless. You're just yes. a contributes a substantial amount to the GDP and the Australian economy. So yeah. we're already, I see the parents, we're already pulling our weight. Yeah, and, yeah. And, and, yeah. and can I, can I go one further? That, uh, there's, with the, and I talked about NDIS, a lot of you are not only mothers, uh, single mothers or single fathers or, or caring, uh, you're, you're, you're carers yeah. for people uh, that are on or aged or some disability as well. So let's not forget that group um, because and with the funding in the NDIS, we will return, you know, with support and care, about 2,270 people in South Australia to full or part-time work to give you, give those people those options that comes with additional income into their households. But where do some of our single parents sit in that when our child was a year too old to get into the trials and still has to wait another two years to get on in Yeah, I look. My daughter is, as you can see, in a wheelchair. Yeah. Um, you know, we're at the point of transitioning from family tax benefits to her own payment. But the changes in the last five years, and especially in the last term of government, mean that we now have to jump through hoops and it can take up to 12 months for her disability to be decided. Yet the government have had proof and have had her down as being a child with a disability since she was two. Can I say that we come a long way as a uh, It took me 111 minutes to get my phone call answered to the disabilities line in Central oh, last oh, week. But, but some years ago you didn't have a line to call. Yeah, but... That's why that is I suspect, I suspect you've formed your own views, but I am here running you, talking to you about what it is that we're dealing with. And we all respect the, what the NDIS is aspirational about doing. We all understand that it has a cost to the community. And we all understand that if you don't set certain parameters and benchmarks, you have got an unwieldy beast in terms of cost and cost recovery. And we understand as parents of children with special needs that if we don't get the funds, we can't help them. I've got a little boy who's near, who just turned five last month and he still can't talk. And I'm at the NBIS office being told, we'll guarantee you a planning meeting by the end of the year. And I can't get him into OT, I can't get him into physio, and I can't get him into speech. And he's got to start school next January, and I can't help him be ready for that. Well, because I, he has to start I, in January. And, and I, I'm sure You're dealing that with all... things that are highly emotional for us, that mean the world to us. And I, and we just want to help our kids. Of course, and that is why the program has been set up. That is why we have one of the, the, the most well-funded disability schemes in the world. I said one of the best disability schemes in the world. Um, I can, we've turned your next. I, I, I just heard everybody speaking about their issues, etc. And I'm here because I just like to have my voice as an Aboriginal woman who lives in South Australia. Now, number one, the cash basics card. Did you know that half of the mob around the state of South Australia are actually leaving their homes and coming down here and, in, and coming down to Adelaide because of the cash basics card? Yes. We've got homeless Aboriginals that are on the street harassing people for money, which isn't a good look for Adelaide, number one, and it certainly isn't a great look for my people, okay? Because they're, 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 uh, domestic violence, yet again, is being committed upon the Aboriginal people of this country, let alone the state, okay? Number one. Number two, the disability scheme in this state. My son is now 11 years old. When he was four, four, five years old and going to do the psychological test to go into school, he was diagnosed by the CATS team at Flinders with a disability. 
Four times doctors from Flinders Medical Centre wrote certificates and filled out all the required paperwork for my son to get disability and said that I was quite valid and able to get it and go for it. And I said, well, it's my son, I love him anyway, so whether I get it or not is what I need. But four times the government rejected my disability claims that the doctors told me to go ahead and go with and, and filled the paperwork, etc. Why? Because the government decided that my son, in their whatever standards were, wasn't uh, up in there. This is after four professionals. And that number two, that's my second point. Number three, I am an Aboriginal woman that was locked out of my family home through de domestic violence. The sad, South Saipol police do not take women's domestic violence uh, reports seriously at all, even though they say they do and that they've changed all of their policies, etc. I'm here to tell you right now that that's all a load of crap. Right, a week after a woman went missing in Manham, I went in to put a DV report into Manham uh, Police Station and they laughed in my face and sent me out the door. And we've had another death. Today. Okay, and we've had another, yeah. Oh. Okay, we had a woman, a sister girl was murdered up, up in a list, uh, just not far from here, right, with her two yeah. children. Domestic violence. You, they weren't, they were known to each other, but domestic violence does not mean there has to be a man and a woman in a relationship, okay? What is being done with for domestic violence and women and children, you know? I, I am now like, no longer in my family home, I'm transient. I, when I went to legal aid commission and, I, and applied for legal aid for legal representation, Aboriginal legal rights, women's legal rights, etc., etc., all turned me away on the basis that because I, my name was on a family home, on the assets and the family assets, I could not um, access legal uh, representation, even though the Constitution says that we all have the right to uh, legal representation. So I just wanted to tell you that um, the system is broken and full of rubbish. Yeah. Some of the, the issues you've raised there, the, the welfare card, um, the Greens oppose the welfare card, and we always have. We think it's really demeaning of people. It actually, it actually um, encourages domestic violence, uh, where women will get bashed because they don't have any cash to hand over to their men, and it also encourages criminal activity. Yeah. Yeah. It's demeaning, it, it stigmatises people, um, and we, we don't support it. Um, on the, the issues around um, domestic violence, I totally agree with you. It's a huge, Stop wearing white ribbons in the halls issue. of parliament when this problem's not getting fixed. One of the things that um, we've announced during the election campaign, the Greens have um, announced a, a large plan to try and uh, make domestic violence a big uh, focus. And part of that is investing in emergency housing and um, so on as a way of dealing with uh, Well, I was just homeless a couple of weeks ago, with all due respect, no, no need, meaning to interrupt you, but you must hear what is going on with what you think is not is going on is not going on, because I had a weekend visit with my children where I was in a situation I was homeless and put into a shelter. They got to women in poverty group, they sent me a food parcel, and I managed to have a little weekend locked away in some little hotel somewhere, okay? When I got left there, they gave me a number and said, now you need to go to a boarding house. And, re and live in a boarding house. You have $165 to spend on a boarding house. I'm a, I'm a mother. I cannot bring my children when I have my visitation time into a boarding house. Yeah. So how is this system helping mothers yeah. and children, homelessness, Look, I, DV? I totally agree with you and I'm really sorry to hear about your, your situation. Oh, it's, no, it's not and, me. There's a whole lot yeah, of us. I know, but the, I want to make the point that I agree um, with you that we need to address it. And one of the things we've been talking about is trying to put more resources into that. We also need to reverse the cuts to legal aid that the Liberals brought in. Um, because uh, that is having a huge impact on uh, people right across the community. And your access to justice shouldn't be determined on your bank the balance. So the that's something that we're advocating for. I, I think we're having an issue as well where I think that women need to be speaking for domestic violence. I think that there should be a team of women deciding what happens, which just isn't happening. It's not happening. Women aren't deciding the best courses of action for women. You're saying that you've been victimised further from being a victim in your situation. And that's disgusting. That is an outrage. Women need to be put in power for this. Not men, not police, not men in suits that decide to put funny gear here or here. Women need to be in charge. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. services in the Lyle McEwen Hospital where women who are threatened or legal services, these are extra services and they are
as great services around as you would know. Uh, That's great. Why are they just great? Which is great well, them being the same thing. I'm telling you, so what is the automation controller? Alright, so that is something that is available that when somebody goes into the Lyle McEwen hospital and there is it doesn't look right and these people are well trained. There are legal services there. Lawyers are available to you. Yep. And there is also another service located in Elizabeth, which you can discreetly, and you can spread this amongst people that you think may benefit, you can discreetly visit them uh, in a shopping centre environment without any kind of attention being drawn to yourself. I call it the Domestic Violence Crisis Line, which is a number that everyone can access if there is a domestic violence situation or in danger. And it was only like a week ago, and they said to me, you're not in a life-threatening situation, so we can't help you. But DD is an ongoing thing. It doesn't, it's not just I'm, you know, punching the head right I'm now. I'm just letting you know what is available to you. Um, um, we have a long list of, just, just on this. Um, maybe after, maybe we can have a talk about it. Because yeah. there is a local service called the North, Northern Domestic Violence oh, Service. Like, yeah. A victim oh, support service to stay home, stay safe. They've just got two years funding yeah. for women to remain in their homes. And the government's given a whole lot of cash in the coffers for women to remain in their homes regardless of whose name is yeah. on the title. But, 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 but in this case, um, if, if you do want it. Uh, we have a good relationship with all the different No, I know, but we might be able to, they might be able to help you out. So yeah. I'm sure they will. Yeah, we'll see what we can do. Yeah, yeah. I'm sure we do have quite a few questions to get through. I've got Jackie next, and then I lean after her, uh, and then Aradia. Oh, no, I, I might can wait. Um, I've got far too much to say for this afternoon. Uh, she might be, but everybody who has <coughs> been involved um, sent me a issues. We have an organisation called Welfare Legal Rights. Now, the only thing they deal with is sensitive issues. So, you can read that. Okay? So, that's the first thing. Second thing I want to say is one of the things I think the government should be looking at is where the funding actually goes to. I find a lot of organisations that have honchos are getting the three quarters of the money and the other 25% is going to the actual workers who are working with the community. The wages of the head on shows in most businesses are beyond the pay. The second thing, the third thing I'd like to say is it's about time we got rid of the ex-prime ministers who are taking a lot of money out. Yes. <laughs> Well, the good news, the good news is, the good news is, the pension scheme which you refer to has been closed down. So, yes, but we've still got Bob we've still got Julia Gillard, we've still got Paul uh, King, all those ex-ministers getting to $200,000 a year for expenses and we have two more secretaries. Why? They're all giving another white collar job as soon as they Jackie, do. Okay, sorry, sorry one sorry. more thing. I'd just like to know where your preferences are going. Um, that's not relevant to this report specifically or I'd Well, it is because if I'm going to give a preference, I'd like to know if they're going to support you stuff.
have no manufacturing base. It's been destroyed. We've got major trade agreements on the cards that will make that situation far worse, and that comes from both the major parties. Their support for those major trade agreements seem pretty clear. Where are the jobs going to come from? Really brief responses from the panel, starting from the other side, who are working this way. You, um, was it Marley? Eileen. Eileen, um, you raised two really important issues there. The first um, being the increased casualisation of the workforce um, and the decline in manufacturing. So in Australia, over the past 10 years, there's been 122,000 job losses in the manufacturing sector alone. When holding closes its doors at the end of next year, there's going to be a conservative estimate of 200,000 further job losses because of that. Now, the Australian government, the federal government, is the single largest driver in the economy. Last year, they spent $59 billion on procurement. But the Commonwealth procurement rules, the framework that they um, use to justify where they're giving their money, at the moment, it's all focused on upfront costs. So there's no consideration of flow and benefits of giving the work to an Australian company whose wages might be slightly higher, but because of their employing locals, they're going to be um, helping families, they're going to be, um, there's a multiplier effect attached to that. So not only they're helping those workers, but the workers around them. When it comes to free trade agreements as well, um, we have seen um, a decline in our trade balances with the trade partners that we have entered into trade agreements with. So we need to be much more strategic in the way that we're entering these agreements. And, and doing things like what America has, where they've, they've negotiated carve-outs for industries that are important to them, like manufacturing and defence, we need to start thinking about that, because that's where our jobs are. And when it comes to identifying where jobs will be in the future, um, we do need to look at where the growth areas are. There's been a report released recently that in South Australia, some of our strongest growth areas are going to be in retail and hospitality and the services sector. So we need to make sure that the services industry is being paid. The lowest pay. Lowest pay. Yeah. 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 So that is the Don't cut penalty rates. And don't explain youth wages. You know, if you're talking about hospitality and you know, and Danielle, Danielle, I'm sorry. You paid me straight. You paid my business. I was on the other end of town. Sonia, sorry. I'm really, really sorry. We are rapidly running out of time. Bob. Yeah, if you want to say an example of a, a multiplier effect for local jobs, and there's a perfect opportunity to build more houses in this area. There's more than enough there. There's plenty of uh, people that need new houses, and you can build them. It's a terrific multiplier effect with transport, manufacturing, and Great opportunities for young people and everybody in the building. Sorry, can we? Um, looking at the Australian progressives, they would like to cut down full-time hours for every worker to only four days a week, with no change to wage. So people will be working less, but staying on a stable income, which could provide more jobs. Also, when you think about it, if you bring in more people into the country via refugees, we are going to need more doctors, lawyers, housing, all of these things, more education, more schools, this actually provides more jobs. Having more people, bringing in more people provides more jobs. I think it's a great opportunity to do so. On inequality, there's a drawing together, which is Labor's plan for tackling inequality. It is the, probably the biggest issue facing uh, societies around the world. Uh, and in particular, uh, we have this conundrum <laughs> where there are there are actually very high tech jobs um, cutting titanium parts uh, in the defence industries, for instance. But often people can't get them because they don't have a trade. They didn't get an apprenticeship. They have plenty of opportunity to retrain. So some of the work we've done here, along with some of the policies we've announced in the last couple of days, which I've got copies of, which are all about giving people that training to be able to access the workforce. In the case of the um, immigration system, most of the refugees I meet um, have worked very hard, tried their very best to get into the labour market, and often, often been successful. The problem I think we do have is there are actually quite a, quite a bit of unskilled labour on the Adelaide Plains, 
but at the moment it's being done by people who are on backpacker visas. And I, I do have a concern that there are sort of um, uh, there are a number of concerning labour market issues about the abuse of these workers um, and their displacing you know um, uh, displacing local uh, employees. So there are quite a few jobs around, but it's about matching up. Uh, the person with the job and getting there are the jobs program. around, did you say? <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, but, but they're not the problem is often the people who are out of work don't have the qualifications to get the jobs, and that can be very I disagree. Well, I have three qualifications I have my nursing certification, and I'm trained, I have my full diploma in one industry. Mm -hmm. I have been out of work for eight years, but I cannot get work. Yeah. And the work is getting, the, the industry is getting worse. Yeah. If one industry is faded, this week, yeah. because of export. Yeah. And the, the, workers, the, the workers that are working in the wine industry are all coming from overseas. And they get paid less. But that, but that was what I, exactly what well, I was talking about. Where, what happens to us? Yeah. What happens to those that have been out of work for such a critical time? I guess the, that's exactly the point. That's exactly the point. I, I, I also like to ask what about the Wombat Shores? Sorry. The Aboriginal yeah. Communities, etc. Well, well, that's a um, very good point. And we, um, we intend to set a target for Indigenous We have to pay for it. We have to prove that we have the skills. But we still can't get them to the work. Well, I think that's that's one of the issues. Is that, as I said before, the displacement of local workforces by uh, people who are on... on um, backpacker visas, but it might well be part of what we could term as guesswork scheme. So I, I've been uh, very concerned about that, and I've been raising it uh, with, uh, uh, you know, with um, policy makers. <coughs> um, and so I think that's we, we now live in a very complex labour market, and what's happening is it's separating out. So there are a lot of high tech, high value jobs, uh, and then there are tribu uh, a group of people who either can't get the qualifications or we can't get a start. And so what's your recommendation? What's your well, well um, we do actually have a policy called Local Jobs for Local People. Um, it provides special uh, set of circumstances um, for particular communities where there's lots of joblessness. Things like the Jobs Expo, and people were talking about, um, before a lot of the speakers were talking about how um, you know, there's this, this public perception uh, about the unemployed. I remember the last time we had a jobs expo at Flayford uh, Civic Centre, and it opened at 10, and at 9.30 there was a massive line-up to get in. So people want to work, people do want to work, and people jobs. endeavour to work. And the great thing about that jobs expo is it put employers and local unemployed people together, and, and it drove outcomes. So um, I think that government can do things, can be part of the role, and we've been rolling out policies to do it. In terms of um, creating new jobs, um, yeah, I agree. We have to we have to be doing that um, here in South Australia. And one of the things that the Greens have been looking at and advocating for is how we can use the skills in our manufacturing industry, because we have a huge amount of skills and expertise in that field here in South Australia. I've had a bill before Parliament which is to encourage electric car manufacturing here in SA because that's actually a multi-billion dollar industry overseas but South Australia doesn't have a foot in that door so there's a real opportunity there. Um, there's also some exciting opportunities I think that come with renewable energy. You know Port Augusta, um, if we put a hundred million dollars into getting the solar thermal happening there, um, that would be great. But, but that's nonsense, Bob. That's just absolute nonsense. Live in the real world. Um, in terms of... Uh, yeah. in terms of uh, other jobs that can come from renewables, I think there's some really great opportunities that can come from things like manufacturing solar and so on here in Australia as well. We actually don't do that at a significant level. We do, but not at a large enough scale, so we should be putting more resources into that. And the final point that I would make is, you know, I went to Wyala recently um, and it was there for the Senate inquiry into Wyala Steel. We need to be supporting the local steel industry here in Australia and the big barrier to doing that at the moment is the free trade agreement. Yes. You know, so the TPP we need to rip it up. Yes. Yeah. And we need to
Labor join with the Greens in the Senate to well, shut down the TPP uh, to ensure that we can protect well, local well, jobs. Well, let's talk about that. Let's talk about that. You're, you're saying, oh, it's the TPP. Actually, Next. Next. Hang on, we're going to change. Boy, thank you. Next speaker. Can we give him short first and yeah. get back to yeah. that? Well, I'm actually uh, quite upbeat about what's coming down the pipeline. Your paycheck. <laughs> Is your pay going up again? If you want to hear from sewage, I, 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 uh, I like you, and my fortunes are tied to the wine industry, and, and it's been dismal for 15 years. Uh, it's been not profitable. So the free trade agreement for the wine industry is a game changer. I don't think people realise how far the run into the industry is actually. Oh, look, I, I need no reminder. But I know how many people aren't employed in the wine industry, which is on our doorstep. It's there, there are real job opportunities for it. But That's what they say about the but, 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 but that is what is growing. That is what will grow by virtue of the free trade agreement. And I'm talking about 71% growth over the last 12 months in that sector on volumes which are now getting to the point where they are shifting the profitability of the wine industry. And I know that. Have you actually seen the availability of positions available in the wine industry? I, look, I, I, look, I, I just want to talk to and the defence industry. I'm talking about an $89 billion, the first time in this nation's history, South Australia will be the hub will be the hub of defence building for, for continuous building. At what cost? Well, the cost is $89 billion. Now that will provide 1,200 new scholarships for undergraduates, vocational education, and, and that will provide them with $20,000. Here, there will be job placements through the service to youth council. That's what those. That's what these schemes do. St Patrick's College, the science and technology, engineering and maths will be bolstered, and they will be involved. The student, the, the defence, there will be 1,100 1, jobs. You can't deny this. This is an Adelaide Oval and a Royal Adelaide Hospital every year for the next 60 years. That's what that is, and if you. You cannot understate the opportunity and the importance of that coming down the line. Now, the free trade agreements, the free trade agreements will unlock the, the, the horticulture of the northern, of the northern areas. It will provide jobs. It, it is doing it, and that's why the government has fast tracked. The, the Northern Adelaide Irrigation Scheme feasibi feasibility, and that is why this government will be committed to throwing those horticultural those jobs. It's 4:55, and we obviously got more people who want to ask questions than we have time. Um, I want to get going in a sec. I, I, I think Rob is get going at five o'clock. Yeah. So we all, yeah. we've got the vigil in the city for Orlando. Yeah. No. Why don't we get the vigil for Orlando? So look. Yeah. I'm sorry. So we really, um, if people want to have like three four hours afterwards, we've got um, food and drinks available. It'd be great to keep the conversation going.
mental health because it is a huge issue that gets overlooked a lot. Um, the access to proper support to psychiatrists that can get you on with medication that can help you. Because GPs will give you medication, but they're only really experimenting. They can't really give you something if they if there really is not enough support for people like me with mental health issues that's been going on for years. So I just want to know what people say. And we regard actually investment in mental health as being an investment, not a cost, because of the huge positive social impact that has. So, and, and I just want to say that before I go, I do have to leave right on five. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to have to rush straight off. But I want to thank you all for sharing your story.